You are now listening to Out of the Blank. 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 Well, welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Eric Ostrom. Hello. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about yourself and what do you do professionally? Uh, well, I am 26 years old and I am a entomologist, which... Entom entomologist? That's the study of insects, right? That is the study of insects, yes. Oh my God, the creepy crawlies that no one ever wants to talk about. And I do not know why. Well, you don't know why. I mean, they're awesome. Everybody should talk about them. Yeah. Psh, let me tell you something. They're, they're scary looking. That's what it is. When you see something with eight legs crawling down your shower pipe, you get a little, little scared there. Okay. That, that is a valid point, I guess. So tell me a little bit how you got started studying in this. Well, when I was five or six, I found a monarch caterpillar and I raised it and watched it grow into an adult. And you can say that's what started it all. And I've been going ever since. Now with entomology, what types of things did you have to study to kind of get to become an entomologist? You didn't just start getting a butterfly net or anything like that and start capturing things, did you? Uh, that's exactly what I did. Oh, so you didn't go to school for entomology? Um, the college I went to didn't have an entomology degree. Yeah, I find a lot of colleges actually don't have that degree for some reason. It feels like it's a very rare field of study. That's why I'm pretty fascinated how you got interested into it. Yeah. Um, so I pretty much taught myself everything. And then in college, we had there was one entomology class. Um, but I took like a lot of like ecology and that type of stuff. And um, they had a small insect collection there. So I made some money working at the university, working with the insect collection and did all that. And uh, right, right after that, I actually got a job in Arkansas for six months doing studies on wild bee populations. And that's probably the most common thing for an entomologist to study, just because that seems like one of the main insects that kind of affect us in a major way when it comes to a lot of the things that we create with honey and um, just the average common job of being a beekeeper, even though that might be rare to some people, that is, a, there are a lot of people out there that do do that job. Uh, they do, although I personally will never be one of them. You're not a fan of the bees? Is that probably your least favorite uh, insect? Oh, no. I love bees. I'm not a fan of honeybees. Honeybees? What's the distinct difference between loving bees and then not really loving honeybees? Well, I'm a big fan of the native pollinators, and honeybees are not native to North America. And I would consider them actually an invasive species and just a uh, um, agricultural domestic livestock animal. Yeah, they've been domesticated, seems like they're not really as, um, it's, it's what really brought this to my attention, I think was, um, I heard uh, Joe Rogan, he actually talked about a story when he was on the set of Fear Factor, um, that they had this distinctive bees, one of the things for Fear Factor, um, they were going to slather up their uh, participants in honey and have them covered in bees, and they had to last a certain amount of time. Well, they brought these bees that were trained to not, you know, sting or, you know, not really hurt anybody. Um, into the like area and this other wild like random bee population arrived and the people had to leave the set so these bees could work it out like they literally were like at conflict with each other mm -hmm. i think it's fascinating when it comes to insects how much people are willing to squash it or disregard it instead of carry it outside i mean i remember my cousin he took this video on his phone and i swear it was something off like a nature documentary it was literally him videotaping a spider that caught a fly in its web and he's showing me this video i'm like what the fuck are you showing me like what am i staring at here like what are you doing and he's like, just watch. And I see this fly like kind of scrambling around in this web, trying to get out, trying to get free. The spider runs down, wraps around it one web, comes back up, 
ties it up, comes back down with another web, and you get to see the string of web, and just keeps doing it about seven or eight times. And then at the ending, he zooms in close to the fly's face. The fly's arms aren't moving, wings aren't moving. It's bam, two, just teeth marks right to the head. I was like, holy crap, you literally just captured nature in its purest form. He's like, isn't that insane? Yeah, if uh, now uh, fear of spiders is like uh, understandable, I'm definitely out there. But uh, if someone ever gets a chance to actually like see that type of stuff happening, you sh they should really take a look at it. It's actually sort of really fascinating to see. So what types of experiences have you had that really kind of stuck etymology into your head? Now, we talked about kind of like the start when you were a kid and stuff. I mean, I had a butterfly net, too, but I never wanted to learn anything more besides maybe catching some fireflies or maybe watching a caterpillar grow up. Mm -hmm. um, well, just that process of metamorphosis from aid to adult, that's just fascinating in and itself but also the sheer number and variety. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. And they're, once you actually just walking down the road, you look in a ditch, you can see stuff you've never seen before in the same area throughout your whole life. And they offer an endless variety of uh, observation well, you got to explain some of this to people, like, because unlike me, I don't, I have no clue, like, where you could even find fascination with the etym etymology. Give me your experience a little bit of what is so fascinating about it, such as, like, was it a certain thing that you learned? Was it, why, like, you're saying the metamorphosis, like, what's the process through that? A lot of people are just going to hear that word and are going to be like, is that from Transformers? Like, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, uh, well, metamorphosis in a nutshell is the transformation pretty much uh, the life cycle of an insect. Uh, so <clears throat> for, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for uh, butterflies, for example, you have the egg, the larva, the pupa, and then the adults. And that whole thing's like the metamorphosis. So for butterflies, just the method of laying eggs differs between species and species. Some species, lay it on only a certain uh, type of leaf on their plant, host plant. Uh, others can lay thousands of eggs, but not hit, uh, lay it on their host plant at all. And the caterpillars have to travel to find their host plant. Now a host plant, that would be like something they're connected to. The, the host plant is what the caterpillars eat. Um, and there's whole bunch of species that only eat one type of plant. Um, well, other species can eat dozens of different types, but uh, they lay the egg and then the caterpillars hatch, and then they molt and grow, and then they create their pupa, which is probably what most people who like raise them and stuff find the most interesting and they can be all shapes and colors and all that type of stuff besides besides becoming a teacher uh that you can do as an entomologist more like trying to educate people on insects what other job things only other thing i can really think of is maybe military where they go and travel somewhere and might have to encounter a certain type of species that um they should be known about such as like i know a lot of insects carry things like malaria or um something dangerous that is not too relative here it seems like uh a lot that happens to do with entomology besides the study of bugs is also kind of being aware about their relationship with people as well oh yeah so like you mentioned there's like the teaching stuff um there's also like the uh, taxonomy realm so like a lot of entomologists work in museums and uh they're the ones that actually look through collected preserved material and uh, describe new species and all that type of stuff and the ones they're the ones that like go out in the field to do the big surveys and all that type of stuff um, and then there's stuff like I do um, so I focus on mosquitoes and I work with mosquitoes and their uh, viruses and all that type of stuff now what types of things have you learned about mosquitoes that a lot of people aren't aware of 
besides them being assholes and always affecting you at the worst possible times. Like when you have two drinks in your hand and one just bites you on the neck and you can't slap it without spilling your drink. Oh, I can sympathize with that one there. Um, probably the amount of different mosquito species that there are. Um, there's over, if the worldwide, there's over 3,000 species. Just of mosquitoes. Just of mosquitoes, yeah. That brings a good point to um, cryptozoology. There's about seven, I think it's like 7.6 either million species that they estimate to be left discovered on land and about 2.2 left to be discovered in the ocean. And a lot of people are like, there's no way. There's no way there's multiple variations of a rhino. There's no, it's like a lot of the animals that are left to be discovered on land are surprisingly mostly probably insects only because of a different species can differ from a simple characteristic. Oh, yeah. They, yeah. Mosquitoes are the same way. So, like, when someone says, like, oh, I killed a mosquito, it's like, but you probably know the, maybe the type they're talking about. Like, what's probably the most common mosquito that a lot of people run into? Um, probably more the pest species, the nuisance species. Um, so, like, um, members of the genus Culex and uh, 80s, um, which they have the most of the Anserophora. Uh, they have mo- the, in North America at least, they have the majority of the nuisance species, but they also have some of the more dangerous species that can transmit uh, diseases. You know, it's funny, I just thought of this. There's going to be people out here that are going to be listening, and they're going to be thinking when you say entomologist or bug catcher, they're going to think of that beginning to Pokemon where you're in the woods and there's just some dude named bug catcher Mike (laughs) and he's wearing like glasses with the hat and like the little thing in front of it to keep the bugs out of your face oh yeah I've gone through Pokemon many times with just a bug team or attempted to at least see that's a great thing or I always talk about how our education system should kind of focus on maybe asking kids what they want to learn and something they might want to do or their interests are to figure out if that's something they want to correlate with later in life and mm-hmm. I'm like you could easily do that if you just looked at a person's Pokemon team when they're playing games like what 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 uh what Pokemon are you using obviously nothing but bugs Pokemon oh you're probably going to grow up to like bugs one day yeah or most people most people would probably say you can't beat a gym leader with those Oh, I'll show you wrong. My Beedrill will take you down in two hits, sir. <laughs> so now exactly what's one thing that kind of bothers you about insects a little bit? Everyone always talks about their appearance, but I talked to a friend of mine who loves snakes and where they have a, a kind of a scaly, just kind of overall uncreepy feeling to you when people start to look at them. He, he basically placed himself in the snake's shoes saying that he's not really comfortable in his own skin. But at the same time, people look at him and think differently before they can truly know how peaceful he really is. Oh, I've never actually thought about that. I mean, you have a fascination with insects. This is something that is not very common amongst a lot of people. You know, nobody, at least nowadays, you're not going to see, you're going to see kids playing more with a tablet than going out and trying to find these insects. There's no more butterfly catcher nets that get sold a lot in like dollar stores and stuff. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, hmm. I'm trying to say what is, what does etymology or maybe this study or hobby that you have, this passion, this drive, what does it mean to you when you look at these insects and you're staring at them? Like oh. <laughs> besides the immense amount of research you can be learning from them, what does it mean inside you? Uh, pretty much everything. It's what I do in my job. It's what I do in my free time. My life pretty much revolves around insects i get that but like i'm saying you're passionate about it a lot of people aren't passionate about their jobs it doesn't mean them it doesn't make up them it's not their inspiration why is it so inspiring to you the endless uh the endless discoveries i guess the research thing that's plus knowing that uh they're the ones that run this world and uh no, the run, what do you mean run this world? They're the ones that pretty much help keep uh, the ecosystems and uh, Earth in general actually healthy. They're the decomposers. Uh, they spread seeds for new plants. 
they aerate the soils, their their own pest control of other species. Um, they make food. With fixing the soil, we're talking about worms, right? Yeah, they a lot of the underground species, like their grubs and stuff, and just underground species in general. Uh, what exactly do the role of grubs play? Because I always used to just pick them up as a kid and throw them. <laughs> uh, well, you can also use them as fishing bait. But uh, yeah, um, grubs are actually a tremendous uh, food source for small mammals and birds and stuff. Because they're they're large and they're meaty and they provide that really good substance for for them. Is that the is that the only benefit that they play is to feed another animal or do they play? You know, I know they're like decomposers, but they're more like they're more things that are ground feeders. Like, do they help kind of carry nutrients to different parts of the soil? It just seems like they're more like built just to feed something else. I you can I should say the the. The food source one is kind of the main big one, but uh, in the my in the lower more lesser role, yeah, the nutrients and stuff uh, from their droppings and stuff just adds more stuff to the soil. They make their chambers, they crawl around, um, somewhat more kind of helps in aeration of the soil like worms do when they move around like that. Um, so they have a couple like more minor stuff, but the I'd say the food one is the main. Now, what insect do you hate the most? If you had to pick one, I mean, you, everyone's got something. Some people hate ladybugs. Some people hate caterpillars. Some people hate tarantulas. Uh, a lot of people, I personally, they're not one of my favorites. My least favorite one, I'm actually going to go with a type of arachnid, but uh, ticks. Mm. How so? Did you have a bad camping experience? I feel like if you're dealing with monitoring insects all the time, you probably encounter ticks a lot. Uh, very much so. Um, well, I've had Lyme's disease twice from ticks. Really? Yes. It, has that been just because of your studies and stuff of looking for insects that you've come across this? Um, yeah. <clears throat> that, uh, yeah. Because where, where I was raised and grew up were like a Lyme disease hotspot area. Mm. And some summers you can just step out of the car into the grass and your leg will be covered with ticks. I used to go camping a lot and I, I used to cover those things up and find them all the time. They're always like, the, I never understood what my dad was like, make sure you check your balls. I was like, what does that mean? He's like, just do it. And the next day you wake up and there's like, three or four under there you're like whoa why are they going here oh because it's warm yeah and i can honestly say ticks are the one thing that i do not understand why they are here well they're a, it's the weirdest thing i think i can kind of attribute to you hating ticks is like it, they're a parasite that's all they are there's nothing that they do they only benefit themselves much like kind of like people want to do the example of like oh humans are parasites technically it's like but we we create things as well ticks literally don't create anything for anything else they only benefit themselves they seem like they cause more of a nuisance than anything and the fact that you had lyme's disease like twice from it and still want to go out and study insects like i i commend you on that one holy crap man a lot of people would have gave it up after the first one yeah that just might amount to i'm kind of crazy like that too so I also have I also have the inkling of picking up any cool reptile or animal I see while I'm out in the field. Is it, now is it, would you would you say that's one of your favorite things that you like to do? Like one of your favorite types of insects, if you had to pick one, which would be your favorite? Um, ants. Ants. Okay. Now I can understand that one because of just how powerful they really are. It seems like. A lot of like they they think like a group they think of like a community mind but ants are ten times like stronger they can lift ten times more of their body weight um, they're very very good problem solvers when it comes to either going over a problem or moving around problem if you drop something in front of a group of or a line of ants they'll go over it they'll go around it they'll move they'll do whatever they possibly can to continue on with their mission. Mm -hmm. They are. Uh... They are a truly fascinating uh, group of insects. Um, 
unfortunately, people don't realize just how vast number there are of ants either. They think they all look the same. Yeah, they don't think that there's different types of ants too, such as worker ants, fire ants, those motherfuckers in Florida. Let me tell you something. My grandma owned a pool, and in Florida, there were a lot of fire ants on her property. So we would have to, you know, run into the grass. You wanted to get a running start to do a cannonball into the pool. Dude, you stepped in this grass more than a minute. You were covered in fire ants down to your legs, and you were freaking out, dude. You were doing anything to get out of that situation. Oh, yeah, fire ants are terrible. But I have been stunned by worse than fire ants. What, what do you mean by worse, though? Species of ant in the southern tip of Texas um, called the hairy panther ant or the Texas bullet ant. And those suckers, who the workers are probably three-fourths of an inch to an inch long. And they have, I would say, the most painful sting of any ants in North America. I don't know if you heard the stories like of the, like the true bullet ants down in Central America. Yeah, the ones that cause like severe pain, like it's like equivalent to giving birth or something. Yeah, um, when you have an ant called the Texas bullet ant, you kind of have to make that connection. Like, hmm, why did they name it that? And uh, if you get stunned by one, you understand why they named it that. I feel like um, there's like a, there's a guy on YouTube. I think he goes and tries to get stung by these crazy insects and stuff. That uh, would you say for someone that is trying to become an entomologist, someone that just wants to research? Because it feels like this type of thing is like what used to be back in the day when someone used to collect, um, you know, types of like uh, Pokemon cards or comic books. Like it seems like that kind of shifted now in society today a lot of people are a fan of what they used to call nerd culture it seems like it's being the the primary thing a lot of people are just interested in what superhero movies wearing a superhero t-shirt it's not really being a nerd is cool is what i would say with kids that are trying to be an entomologist it seems like they're 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 all, they're really really isolated from people just because they find a fascination with bugs and it's something a lot of people just find disgusting. What would you say for people that are in that position when they feel like they want to research bugs but they don't want to be seen as weird? Um, well, I was I was kind of in that same position because um, I know for a fact I was definitely the only person like within the surrounding cities who actually enjoyed it bugs and stuff um and at plus as, as i got older it always seemed increasingly weird to have a grown-ass man with a butterfly net running in the field hey you're catching more than you're catching more than insects you're catching hopes and dreams my friend exactly so it sound i i all i can say is embrace it and then it sounds simple to do but it can be it can be uh, difficult, but luckily for me, I actually had the support of my whole family. So, did you, when you say you you had the support of your whole family, they just understand that you have this inspiration or kind of fascination towards insects that a lot of people don't. I feel like that's what also um, gets mislooked sometimes. Like when you're when you're first of all, if that kid, the one that feels like he's not understood by anybody, the one feels like he's isolated from everyone. I can guarantee that you're going to be picked in any survival mission or anything where someone gets stuck on an airplane and it crash lands because they want to know what the hell is on that island and you're going to have all that information. Very much so. People will, people might think you're weird, but if they see a creepy crawly that they're not sure, they'll sure as hell send it to you and see if you can ID it for them. Um, so when it comes to that, they really – they can be happy that you know what you're doing. I feel like a lot with insects, though, is very impacted by the types of things that are going on with our earth right now. It feels like back in the day, I used to see a lot of caterpillars. I used to see like the giant green ones, the ones that used to go on trees and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I used to see the these ones that had hair on them. They were like brown and black. Uh, the woolly bear. Yeah, that thing was like, what the? F it's it's it's, it's snuffleupagus. That's what it is. It was snuffleupagus, and it was like they were so cool to capture, put them in a little jar, and then like I remember one time I freaked out because I went to go look at my um, caterpillar in this little habitat I bought for it, 
and it turned into a cocoon. I was like, oh shit, like, did I do something wrong? Like, did I break something? Did I, you know, did I not feed it properly? And then after like a week, it just started to hatch. I mean, I remember first grade, we all captured these um, monarch caterpillars and we, we sat there and watched them grow into butterflies. And at the ending of like, when it was time for them to get released, we had these things that we literally bonded with in class hanging above our desks. And we decided to release them. It was one of the most peaceful moments ever, especially in like first grade, man. That's such a big experience for you. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, we we raised caterpillars and hatched them. I don't know if it was first or second or summer around there, but we did that as well in school. I don't see those things happening in school anymore. I feel like a lot of our priorities and stuff have shifted a whole nother way. It seems like our kids more happy with the tablet than enjoying watching a butterfly grow. Yeah, unfortunately, I think doing stuff like that is definitely an important thing to do. Would you say the types of things that are happening with our environment are affecting a lot of like your work and research in a way, like being able to exhume and kind of understand new species? Yes. Um, kind of affects pretty much all the species. Surprise! It affects mosquitoes as well, actually. I don't think we're quite prepared to how adaptive adaptive mosquitoes can be to a changing environment. What do you mean by how adaptive they are? Are you saying that there's more of them? Or are you saying the number hasn't changed? It seems like I don't run into really mosquitoes anymore. Um, so uh, I'll, an, an uh, example I'll use is uh, Aedes aegypti. So that's the mosquito that will spread uh, uh, dengue, Zika, chikungunya, and those uh, just a very variety of uh, diseases, but they are a warm, tropical, more human loving species. More human loving, such as like they're just humid, well, human and humid. Humid. So, are they saying that they don't bother us as frequently as other mosquitoes do? Oh, no, they they like to be around us. Oh, those sons of bitches. Yes, but they're a tropical, warm species, and they really like the humidity in the air and stuff yeah there's certain types of uh like climates and stuff that bring out certain insects as well you know like if you think of like um, i'm about to paint a picture for you much like bob ross here so imagine like it's a misty kind of like night it's kind of just like sun's just coming down you're looking out into your backyard you get to start seeing like back on the day you would see fireflies you would see those things just mm -hmm. literally feels like it's like it's not really humid and it's not really cold it's just just the right temperature we got a short sleeve shirt on you're seeing fireflies go around that was a thing that a lot of us kids used to do we used to capture these things and put them in a jar hopefully you poked holes in them so you didn't kill them all but you had them in a jar you get to look at them at night now that has completely shifted it seems like there's not enough time for those moments as well such as like it seems like it gets darker faster um, it seems like the weather's kind of always flip floppy and you never get to see lightning bugs anymore. Uh, yeah, that's uh, very true. A lot of places there's been noticeable declines. Um, of course, there are still a lot of places where they are still there. Uh, but yeah, with the changing, you know, fireflies can be pretty susceptible to that too because they require, larvae require like pretty much water type like marshes uh swamps they like that really high moisture um so like when those are destroyed or those dry up so does the firefly population in that area now through your research and stuff like take me through the beginnings of your research like how do you start off the process of researching do you get your kind of like like, do you have to get your notes? Do you have to bring pen and paper? What equipment are you using? Like, what? Wh how do you go out and try and at least do a little bit of your work? Um, it's like the, the beginning process of it? Yeah, take me through your whole process, the understanding, the documentation. I know you have to be writing some of this shit down. I mean, there's no way you can just remember it all. Oh, no, we, it's, uh, it require, uh, we uh, do quite a, quite a bit of uh, brainstorming beforehand. Um and just writing down like the things we would want to accomplish, um, how we're going to collect them, um, to who do we want to collaborate with, and um, that, that actually that takes that can take quite a while to get everything in order there, and then it's a, 
applying for grant money for that research and hoping you get approved. How do you pitch off? How do you pitch off something to somebody to, you know, be able to get research funded for something like this? It seems like you're a lot of the times people are going to look at you like etymology, like you want to go study insects to go out there and study them. It's free. It's open air, but it's like there, there has to be resources that have to be involved as well. So we get funding from the federal government for our research because um, it's an institution. So sometimes we don't even have to do much for if like natural disasters happen, like a f severe flooding or a disease outbreak or hurricane. Um, we usually get funding to do research projects for the next few years around that those areas from the effects of those disasters. Um, so that's the one type of stuff we get. For more uh, personalized and research for our group, um, you just uh, look at different grants and you have to, and the uh, grants usually provide you uh, uh, general areas or keywords that you need to include in your proposal. And so if you, if you're a good enough writer and you can add all those, all those keywords and what they're looking for into your proposal, they'll, you'll have a much better chance of getting money for that grant. Now, how do you pitch something to some, if you were going to pitch etymology to somebody, how would you describe it? Like, what is it, what is it, we talk about what does it mean to you, but how would you describe it for someone else? For me coming from my just talk with you, I would try and understand it as etymology is the research and kind of really what insects mean to not only that impact us, but also on our environment. Like there are a lot of what I would consider the working man or the working wings of getting everything set up for us to live this life. Like we talk about pollination. We talk about all these types of things that a lot of people do not think about. A lot of people walk out their door and they see a flower and they're like, oh, oh that flower had to grow from something. All the rain, everything. They always chalk it up to the fucking rain. Did you know that maybe that was not supposed to be there? Maybe a certain bug or something carried or maybe the wind or something drifted off a certain seed that lined up perfectly and it had to be pollinated in some way. It's like the movie uh, B movie. I remember we watched that like in like fifth grade or something. And it was it made people think of bees differently, mostly because a lot of people just thought that's where they got their honey, but no one understood that if the bees are gone, flowers are gone too. I guess I would say uh, entomology, welcome to how the world works. How the world works, I like that. Put it on a t-shirt. Oh, that's a good idea actually. Now, what types of materials are you taking to kind of discover bugs? Are you taking a journal? Are you taking uh, obviously you're probably taking a net or something, right? Unless you're grabbing these things with your hands. Um, so in my, in my free time, I, I work with pretty much all insects. And so I go out and my goal for me personally is to rediscover new species, especially ants. Um, so I go out, I have my net, I have uh, dating tools. Um, I have my field journal um and a camera i because i photograph and document like the ant where the ant nests are located their sizes what they look like what they're using as nest material because i feel that's important for species description life history descriptions as well maybe even helping species differentiation you never know um so I try and at least write down, take pictures, document all that I can, because some of it might not seem they'll do anything for you, but they're insects. There's always a possibility that the most obscure thing that you might not think any, anything about is probably could be the most important thing. Now, when it comes to identifying a characteristic that can define a different ant species, how hard is that? Because just based on how ants are so small, it seems like a lot of already has been discovered. How do you discover a new species of ant? Uh, extremely high magnification. Because um, some differentiation between species can be so minute as the angle of a certain body part or the angle or, or a number of uh, hairs in one spot or 
the indentation or the number of pitting in a certain area. So that's how a lot of species are. Unfortunately, they made uh, insects kind of made sure they don't make it easy for us. Um, there's some species that look can look widely different, even in the same nest, but they vary so much that you don't know if a different species that looks exactly the same is actually the same species because they can look like three different species, but they're just the same one. Um, so that's where like a molecular and DNA analysis is as, the, as it, it's hopefully cheaper, that's going to be the best way to differentiate species. Now, if I had to ask you, what is your most memorable thing with an insect, whether it was through your travels or whether it was something as in a kid, do you, how, like, can you explain it a little bit to me? Like, what's one fond memory? I always kind of, I remember this one time I met at Gray Mantis and I picked it up and I, I knew they could fly because at this time it was when I was a kid, Bugs Life was out for PlayStation. So I, there's a mission where you get to fly as a prey mantis. So I was like, these things can fucking fly. And my buddy's like, what is that? Oh, that's so cool. I'm like, yeah, it can fly. And he's like, there's no way. It has wings. It just glides. I'm like, okay. And then this thing jumps out of my, like off my hand and flies right at my buddy's face. And I've never heard anybody scream that high pitch before my entire life <laughs> uh well mantises can look pretty intimidating when they're flying right straight at you. you're like what the hell is that my i would say one of my fondest memories um i was me and my back in high school me and two of my buddies wanted to look at uh put on some nights at light to do some collecting but uh, what turned into a slow night ended up being one of the most awesome nights I can ever remember out collecting insects. Um, we had many Luna moths show up, the Cecropia moth, Polyphemus moth. Those are the huge giant silk moths. And uh, just a number of them that were there you were able to like cover your face up and then our arms were covered in like uh, uh, sphinx moths, which are other pretty large moths. And so there were like dozens and dozens of these humongous flying insects. I'd never seen that before in one night in one place. And it was, it was pretty spectacular. Now, how often or how common is it to come across a black widow? Because I had this memory of when I was like eight years old, when I was hanging from this tree. And I remember like it was like, a, uh, I think it was a couple months before we learned about black, widow, black widows in class. Someone was like, black widows, like one bite, you're dead. That's it. They have a red hourglass on their back, all this type of stuff. And I was hanging from a tree and I looked near my hand there was a black widow spider on this tree and I freaked out and ran inside and nobody fucking believed me. How common is it that black widows are? Like how, how, how often are they outside or are they more likely to come encounter with people? Am I, is this just something I created in my mind or is this something that was real? So there are different species of black widows and within their respective ranges, um, it all depends on the type of habitat. So they prefer more dark, secluded areas. So underneath stuff, um, inside an open building or inside a building, I guess, too. Uh, just somewhere where it's dark, um, very little space so they feel secure. Um, and... I can say they are definitely not out to bite you. <laughs> they, the only reason they would bite you if you grabbed one and s kind of push it on your skin or you accidentally uh, roll on top of one and it's just scared. Um, yeah, this thing seemed like it was just hanging out by my hand. He was probably there for a while. He wasn't. I didn't even notice until I looked up. I was like, "Whoa, this thing's right by my finger!" And I, I in my head, I was like, "Oh, what, did he just get there? Was he coming after me? I don't know." But it was, 
maybe I came across a certain species of black widow because I, I remember it so distinctly. It was something I have never seen before. Plus, uh, juveniles can a lot of times will have like more red on their abdomens than the adults. Um, so they can actually, there's some variation in the amount of coloration. Um, but uh, the only, so their, their bites will hurt. Um, they are venomous. Um, but if you're a, if you're a normal person, it's not going to kill you. I thought I was going to get superpowers like Spider-Man when that thing was near me. I was like, I could have been Spider-Man if this, I feel like that's what also increased a lot of fascination with people and insects when Spider-Man came out. Oh, I would say so. Yeah. There were people out there that were buying tarantulas, like bite me in the neck, give me powers. I own tarantulas. I don't do any of that stuff anymore. Okay, maybe I'm the weird one. <laughs> but when it comes to like, I think a lot of people also relate to when it comes to bugs as well. The common ones that a lot of people on like the East Coast can be surrounded with, which is which are cicadas. Um, people commonly refer to them kind of like the nighttime callers, the ones that always come out at night and do these things. And they're actually wrong about that. Cicadas actually do a lot of their stuff during the day. I never really knew much about cicadas i thought they were like if you take those snake eyes those metal rocks that connect to each other and they make like a noise if you take them, throw them up in the air i thought that was just some i thought it was my neighbor basically throwing rocks around i was like damn he's out there throwing rocks again it's like no those are cicadas in the trees and i'm like what's a cicada and i remember a little bit later on i came across a wasp that stung a cicada and it was dying in front of me. And I was just looking at this ginormous, like, look like a horse fly. But it was, like, so weird I didn't want to get close to it. I think a, a lot of things like that can defer in people's minds. And it's pretty interesting to find out what it truly is, like, what type of species of insect that is as well. A lot of people just want to, you know, crush a bug, throw it out the window or something, instead of actually taking the time to classify it and see what it actually is. Yeah, uh, um, the mentality for many insects is uh, squish f first, ask questions later. I, th I definitely think so, especially when it comes to like, it seems like every time someone encounters a spider where they need to kill it or set the house on fire, it's in like the worst possible times. Like, can we just make an agreement? Like, bro, I won't bother you if you don't bother me when I'm taking a shower. Those type of things are, so I'm on Facebook, I'm, I'm on a couple insect identification pages. And uh, you have no clue how many of those pictures that get put up of parents asking for IDs of a squished spider because they're afraid of the spider going after their children or chasing their children or attacking their children. So they squished it and then they send us a picture and want us to try an idea. Like, first of all, IDing a spider <clears throat> in a picture in the first place it's extremely hard, let alone having it squished where you can't see any of the of the things to features and makes it worse. But the worst part is they all, ninety five percent of them, all swear it's a it's a brown widow or a brown recluse. Yeah, yeah. I've actually a lot of people I know actually like got bit by a spider, and I think they created what like a placebo effect where they're like, "Look, it's swelling. Look at this. Oh, it's burning. It's a, this sensation." I'm like. Is it really, or are you just creating all this in your head? Don't get me wrong, spider. Some spider bites can like feel like a can itch a little bit. You might get a little like a mosquito bite type of thing, but really, none of them are out there to go after you. They're they prefer to be left alone. It's unfortunate, but what can you do? Slowly but surely, we're trying to educate people on that aspect. It's hard to be of understanding of something that looks so different from us. You know what I mean? I feel like that's where a lot of people's judgment comes from is when something looks different than you. Yeah, that's that's a very good point, too. Well, Eric, I really appreciate you coming out and doing the podcast and kind of educating people a little bit on insects in general, maybe opening up some people to, hey, let's go out with our butterfly nets and catch some shit. Oh, yeah. If you have a chance to do it, I suggest you do it. Once you start looking at once you see butterflies and you'll start noticing other insects and then you'll start noticing more of the smaller ones. And it literally opens up a whole new world to actually observe and enjoy. 
Well, I want to give you here a minute at the end to kind of promote your YouTube page as well, so people can find a little bit of your research and work. Uh, yes. Um, so both on Instagram and YouTube, I have the daily entomologist uh, stuff. Post uh, of my, I go out when I'm out uh, looking for insects or working on my personal collection. I do videos, post it on the Daily Entomologist YouTube. Um, and I do a lot of photography uh, of insects and stuff. And so the Daily Entomologist Instagram is where I post all those pictures. And if you want to, I, I like to think I post uh, some cool, not very often seen stuff on there. Um, it's definitely some interesting stuff. Yeah. So yeah, if anyone's inter interested in that, give them a look. It'll make your skin crawl a little bit too. I'll tell you that. Seeing some of the pictures on there, I see the up close pictures of all the spiders and insects. I'm like, oh my god. Yeah, I get up close and personal. Well, thanks so much, Eric, for being on the podcast, and stay tuned for another episode out of the blank. Yeah.